It is 12 o'clock and we're going to get this discussion started. Uh, welcome, my name is Femi Cadmus. I'm law librarian and professor of law at the Lillian Goldman Law Library at Yale Law School. And we're so delighted uh, this afternoon to have as part of our Yale Law Library speaker series, Ashley Han Bolt, who is the 26th Law Librarian of Congress. So welcome, Aslihan. She is um, an old friend and colleague, and I'm just um, excited that she can join us today. What a delight to have you. So I'm gonna go, um, we have lots of questions. Uh, we actually fielded our questions before the webinar. So what we did was we solicited questions and I have a lot of them, and I'm hoping that we can get through them in about an hour. Um, this is not an interactive webinar, so I apologize for that. Um, hopefully, that burning question in your on your mind is going to be answered this afternoon. And if not, I think um, Aslihan is welcome to receiving questions after the webinar, so we can always funnel questions uh, to her. But before we get started, I wanted to do the introduction of our guests. Um, um, Aslihan Bullitt, who's the Law Librarian of Congress, and as I mentioned, she's the 26th, so there have been 26 of them. Um, prior to being the Law Librarian, uh, she served as the Deputy Law Librarian for Collections uh, at the Law Library of Congress, uh, where she oversaw the Global Legal Collections uh, Directorate, and um, also um, oversaw the priorities, design, launch, and execution of law library initiatives related to physical and digital collections. Interesting facts about Aslihan before joining the law library, she served as the director of academic services in the California State University system at the San Jose State University King Library Campus, where she provided leadership, planning and administration for collection development, research support and instruction. For most of her career, she has developed unparalleled experience in academic law libraries, ranging from the libraries at Harvard Law School, and uh, she was also at Columbia uh, University School of Law. So I'm going to stop there so we can start asking questions. But as you can see, uh, she has a varied background, which is going to give us a lot of order for the questions uh, this afternoon. So I'm gonna go straight into the questions that we received. Um, but first of all, I'm gonna have Aslihan tell us a little bit about her background and how she eventually became a law librarian. Uh, being a law librarian myself, I know that it is often a profession that most of us stumble into. It's typically not planned, but I'm interested in your route, Aslihan, and I'm sure most of the people listening to law librarianship. So tell us a little bit about your background. We don't wanna be nosy, but <laughs> We don't mind hearing a little bit about personal stuff, whatever you're comfortable sharing this afternoon. Certainly. Well, thank you so much for this invitation. It's uh, an honor to join you today. Um, I do have a sort of a, I guess, um, um, not typical uh, background into librarianship. I mean, I, I, I was, I have always been in love with the written words since I was just a little girl. And one of my first jobs was in my local public library as a reference page. And uh, I, I, I have to thank my older sister, Sarah, for encouraging me to apply to that first library job while I was still in high school. And, but it was truly only after obtaining my uh, master's degree when I realized fully the true meaning and um, appreciation for the profession. And I guess at its core, what has attracted me or what I love about librarianship and libraries uh, and, and the whole public library concept in United States uh, as, you know, the principle of access to knowledge and information and, and the profession as a whole, as the vehicle um, to ensure access to, to um, information and knowledge, right? And above all, it's, it's a service-oriented profession. In fact, when I got my MLS from Rutgers, the S in uh, the MLS used to stand for service. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> I know it has now changed to information science, you know, it's uh -huh. an MLIS degree, but, um, Secondarily, you know, working at institutions that truly uh, carried out a mission that I believed in and um, being able to carry out that principle of service and access uh, was always very important for me. 
uh, you, you kind of highlighted uh, my most recent career highlights. Yes, you know, I was at San Jose State. I t did take a small departure from law libraries uh, and I did gain a lot of uh, experience in my short duration in, in the CSU system. Uh, as as the, the largest uh, state university system in the country with, you know, 23 campuses. And so their truly uh, management, uh, working in a state institution, as well as uh, uh, managing a, a 10 year track group of librarians offering, you know, services to the public. And it was very unique there where they shared their building uh, with the San Jose Public Library System, which is also very large. So that was a really incredible experience. Um, before that, yes, I was uh, an FCIL librarian and program coordinator at Harvard for yeah. just a little over seven years. And um, there, I think a lot of our audience here can relate to the traditional law librarian functions. Um, we also, um, uh, the FCIL librarians at Harvard at the time also did collection development. So I, I was uh, the and selector for, for, uh, for our viewers who don't know what an FCIL librarian. Oh is. yes, I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm using okay. acronyms already. Yes, please do stop me if I'm using too many acronyms. So FCIL is Foreign Comparative and International Law, and um, so at Harvard, the Foreign Comparative and International Law librarians also are selectors and. I was a selector for jurisdictions across Central, South, and Southeast Asia, and I really enjoyed collection development. Um, and then, you know, we all had different liaison responsibilities. One of mine was to the Islamic Legal Studies program, and I was a library editor for their Sharia source uh, platform. Um, Prior to that, I was at Columbia, uh, as you mentioned there, it was also a wonderful position because Columbia had this unique um, rotation system mm -hmm. for their reference librarians, where you are also a lecturer in law, um, so you're an adjunct faculty there, and you do these year-long rotations, um, so mine were um, supervising the interlibrary loan department, uh, coordinating the first year legal research and writing program, uh, vendor liaison to Westlaw Lexus, Bloomberg, oh, and, and Expresso. So yes. Home, yes. <laughs> yes, the biggies. Yes. And then uh, a whole year on, you know, FCIL work, uh, where you work with the FCIL librarian, yes. which I, I insisted on actually doing two years in a row because I really wanted to be an FCIL librarian. Um, and me you know, too, me too. I wanted to be that was my dream to be an <laughs> FCI librarian. I never became one, but um, did, oh. uh, did work with foreign and comparative international law collections, but didn't have that type. So, yeah, and it relates with me too. That's a that's a fantastic. It is, isn't it? Because it really gives you the um, best of. Uh, both or the whole world, uh, because you are constantly. Uh, learning uh, and uh, serving patrons uh, often from all around the world too, yeah. because at Harvard, uh, we I worked very closely with um, providing services to graduate students enrolled in the SJD and LLM programs. Mm -hmm. yeah. SJD is the doctorate degree in law, Thank LLM is the master's Thank degree. Um, and um, prior to all of this though, I mean, LC now, the Library of Congress is, uh, my 11th library that I've wow. worked in 11th since library. high school, since high wow. school, Still. So pre and post MLS. That is amazing. Oh my goodness. But you know, you were talking about foreign collections and what, what I skipped in your introduction is that you're a Turkish immigrant. And right. I wonder how the immigrant um, experience, how it informs um, your role and your position as the as the law librarian of congress because you're bringing in such a rich cultural perspective um so anything to say about that about your background? that is that is right i i came to us when i was 10 i finished elementary school in turkey i didn't speak a word of english um and i was very much raised by you know typical um, immigrant parents of where truly the recognized professions, as you know, are law, medicine, and engineering. 
<laughs> so <laughs> as an undergrad, I, I majored in biology and I minored in pre-law. And um, I, I guess I was drawn to law. A lot of things affected me with law and throughout undergrad. And I, I mentioned since high school, I was working, my part-time job was always in libraries. And um, I never really thought about pursuing uh, librarianship as a profession because I was really, you know, going for medicine or law. But um, once I finished uh, undergrad, I I wasn't really sure whether I, I wanted to pursue law. And mm -hmm. so I thought, given I, I enjoyed library work so much and I enjoyed librarianship, I thought, you know, having an MLS would be a great foundation for medicine or law. Because even if I had gone into medicine, I think I was drawn still to the research um, portions, like the classes I took. And so I, I went into MLS thinking this will be a great foundation for law school or medical school, even if I don't become a librarian. And um, so, I mean, I my immigrant background, I guess it's true with anything, right? Even knowing a different language, it gives you a, a whole other perspective on, on anything you do. And as I mentioned in the intro about why I'm drawn to the profession, I, I think you have a special appreciation for uh, the First Amendment in this country as an immigrant than I think most Americans perhaps take for granted, including the, the notion of every town has a public library that is filled with resources that that you have access to at your fingertips. I mean, I learned English reading uh, Curious George <laughs> at my public library. It, it's true. Oh, and then I graduated to like Nancy Drew <laughs> series. And I, and then when I finished the full run of Nancy Drew at my public library, I, um, the librarian who had really was so nice to me. <laughs> she, um, I, 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 obviously the, the series were missing volumes mm. in my public library and she introduced me to interlibrary loan oh wow which i was amazed that's kept secret yes. now i have access to other collections uh, so i um i guess that you know the that was the the love of of libraries especially public libraries i think was ingrained as an immigrant especially at a very early age because it mm. i truly felt the public library was a uh, was a refuge and a welcoming place that was filled with services and, and information that I, I didn't have. Yeah. Um, so um, you talked about, you know, your background as an academic law librarian and now you're in government. I wonder what surprised you the most with this transition um, from you know being an academic law librarian at Columbia and at Harvard and at in the California state system, and boom, you're thrown into this government bureaucratic big system of libraries. What surprised you the most? What were you not prepared for? You know, you, you always feel like you're prepared for everything, but <laughs> something surprises you. So that that is true. And and given this was my first federal government position, there was a lot of um the learning curve was was huge. Um, initially, I guess the size of LC is insane, right? There's over 3,000 staff here at the Library of Congress. Um, and the, the level of oversight and control in a bureaucracy is so much greater in government than in academia. Um, and now granted, you know, both Harvard and Columbia were private institutions, so it's very different. But having worked in the CSU system as well, um, the, the federal government work, the, the, the oversight is, is much, much greater. And everything, mm -hmm. and I mean everything, <laughs> takes forever. Every decision goes through multiple layers of approval. Wow. to ensure everything is done according to rules and regulations. Okay. Um, I'll give you a perfect example right now with AALL. This is the American Association of Law Libraries Conference coming up in July and then IFLA mm -hmm. in August. Preparations for attending those conferences start at minimum 
six months in advance wow. here uh, because of the number of approvals and authorizations that your travel has to go through. Um, on the plus side, uh, that level of reporting does provide an automatic uh, level of transparency in that there are obviously built in uh, fail safes to ensure compliance, which which is lacked in especially private academic institutions. Um, I'm also, you know, this is another thing, although we are all, I think, as a whole in the profession are, are experiencing attrition post pandemic mm. here at LC, the experience is incredible. We just recently recognized length of service awards here mm. this week, mm -hmm. and there were colleagues here at LC who were celebrating their 55th year anniversary mm -hmm. of having worked here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I am just astounded and really fortunate to be surrounded by an incredibly experienced professional and hardworking colleague. So it's, it's truly all the worthwhile to do my best to, to serve them. And, you know, the challenge in an organization this big um, is also there are a lot of competing priorities mm -hmm. and a you know finite number of resources, right? So we have a lot of dependencies and we have to work very hard to prioritize our needs and, and really strategize years in advance for planning and execution. So projects that we are devoted to carrying out uh, are, are often cross agency mm -hmm. with multiple divisions, not only in LC, but a lot of external private and public partnerships mm -hmm. that, you know, brings the project to fruition. So those are some of the stark differences. So thank you. Um, so the other question we received, which is, well, this is a good segue into it. And I don't know if this is such a thing as a typical day, but the question is, what is a typical day in the life of the Law Librarian of Congress? So if there is a typical day, because- it's, it's pretty atypical. <laughs> there are certain things that are routine, but so my, obviously my uh, primary responsibility is managing the policy and operations of the Law Library, which, uh, contains the world's largest collection of legal materials. So um, my typical day is quite a number of meetings. <laughs> um, I mean, first and foremost, obviously we support the Congress. So I, I make sure that uh, our support to the members of Congress with legal resources to assist them in executing their constitutional duties are, are the resources are aligned as such. Mm -hmm. uh, and in supporting the public, uh, we receive so many interesting and varied questions on every single day. So it's hard to say what the typical requests we get are, but my typical day also includes a lot of um, presentations, briefings. Uh, we have uh, constantly both domestic and foreign delegations visiting us regularly. I'll tell you in the, in the last few months, like this is to give you a sense of the, the delegations and the diversity of visitors we have here. We've hosted visits from presidents of Tunisia, president of France. Uh -huh. We had foreign delegations from South Korea, Canada, mm -hmm. Trinidad and Tobago, uh, the State Department, uh, Department of Justice, uh, Army JAG Corps. We had a large delegation from Navarra University in Spain, about 120 students visiting us. Mm -hmm. uh, we hosted briefings to ABA's Commission on Immigration. And this is just, I want to say, in the last three, four months, these, these groups and many, many other delegations that we provide briefings to. So I usually meet them. I, I do an overview of the law library. So my typical day is lots of meetings, presentations, routine administrative work. However, I will say that recently I um, started helping out at our public services division in the reading room on the reference desk, oh, wow. uh, which, which where we are short staffed at the moment. Uh, <laughs> those of you in the audience who might be considering career opportunities, I think we have at least two vacancies that have been posted. Um, I am so enjoying going back to my roots of being a reference librarian. And I, I will say to, to 
to those in the audience who are in management or leadership positions that, you know, to take the time to serve at the front line, uh, even if that's where you rose up the ranks from, to go back. Um, and what it does is, you know, it truly allows you to understand the demands of the work, yeah. connect with your staff, um, gain perspective, and, and really develop a, a level of empathy um, and understanding that's hard to, to comprehend when you're so ingrained in administrative work. So my, my work days are long, atypical, but very rewarding. I'm probably, I'm a little rough at the reference desk right now. I am. You say that. Um, <laughs> it is true. But the chief, our chief of public services division, uh, Beth, she always calls when I'm on the desk. I mean, like I said, are you checking up on me? Am I, I'm probably more of a liability than a, <laughs> than anything else at the desk. So I, but I'm, I'm really, really enjoying it. It's okay. great. So this segues again to the next question about the role of the Law Library of Congress, and it probably has evolved since the beginning of time, um, but people are not always familiar with what they can gain, you know, by connecting with the Law Library of Congress. Maybe people know about the Library of Congress. They know they can go in there, their tours, and it's a beautiful building, but the Law Library of Congress is a little bit more um, hidden. Um, if you're not um, in the DC area, most DC residents know about it, but if you're somewhere in Montana or in Alaska, what can the Law Library of Congress do for you? What kind of outreach is provided to the public? And that's always uh, sometimes a mystery for some. So if you could help demystify, you know, the, the function of the Law Library of Congress, that would be wonderful. Yes, no, absolutely. I think that the 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 name right when it's library of congress or law library of congress it throws off people uh, that you know we only support the congress and so first and foremost we certainly do support the congress um and we draw on the the unparalleled unrivaled collection of our domestic foreign and international materials and the the expertise here the the law library team is highly experienced and consists of librarians, law librarians, foreign law specialists. And they, our foremost goal is providing Congress with timely and comprehensive research for uh, domestic foreign comparative and international law queries. But we also assist the, the US executive agencies and the judiciary. Um, we are mandated to, to also serve them. And this is, we are the, um, only uh, division in the Library of Congress that serves all three branches of government. And this is really something we are very proud of. On the public services end, uh, our public services division experts provide reference services to the public. So the reading room is open to the public uh, and they can also be uh, reached virtually uh, through the Ask a Librarian uh, link on law.gov, which is oh. our URL. Okay. Um, so when the pandemic actually affected our operations, we quickly and successfully adapted to changing the environment with a focus on creating and improving and enriching our multiple online resources. So all of our classes and webinars are available online and open to the public. Uh, we have a legal research institute and we have focused um, in addition to those public offerings, our focus on digitization projects to make the collections uh, accessible, freely available to, to everyone really, uh, domestically and internationally. Um, so that, that is a, our goal and, and serve, continue to serve the public as well as the government agencies. We, by, I mean, de facto, the law library is the nation's custodian of, of this legal and legislative collection. Our collection is about 3 million items from all countries and legal systems around the world. And that's just the print collection. Uh, it represents more than 300 foreign and international jurisdictions. And many people are surprised that over 60% of the collection is actually foreign law. Mm -hmm. uh, consisting of primary and secondary sources of law in original languages. 
Uh, so we acquire, uh, maintain, organize, preserve, and provide access to this collection in all formats, print, microform, digital. The reference collection in the reading room is about 30,000 volumes. We also have a, an extensive treatise collection. We have a global legal resource room that is like a ready reference for foreign collections. And we have an amazing rare book collection that is our treasure collection that is about 90,000 volumes of books and bound manuscripts issued uh, prior to 1801. Mm. This all of this is managed, believe it or not, by a team of only around 70 employees. Mm -hmm. So who are not only providing research reference uh, and collection related services, but also hosting events. We have uh, lots of, uh, in addition to our monthly webinar series, we have signature events. So in the last six months, and these are all open to the public. We've organized and, and celebrated the Human Rights Day. We um, launched an exhibit um, in December uh, titled Join in Voluntary Associations in America, which has been which has received really uh, well uh, press attention. Uh, we've had several events that accompanied that exhibit. Mm -hmm. Our um, Lunch and Learn webinars are on varied topics. Um, it's usually recent developments on, on either US law or foreign law and includes recurring topics on orientation to law collections or research strategies. Um, we also recently co-hosted with the American Bar Association Law Day. Um, mm -hmm. So these, all of these events, as well as offerings through the Legal Research Institute, our reading room, are all accessible to anyone uh, around the world, not just now domestically. You, you just, I'm in DC and I want to drop by, stop by the Law Library of Congress. How easy is it to get into a building like yours? Yeah, certainly you are welcome to come and get a reader registration card. And once you do that, you can access uh, any of the reading rooms, including the law library's reading room as a researcher. Uh, you can do a self-guided tour of, of the Jefferson building, which is just, in my opinion, the best looking building in DC. Um, and certainly if you have research needs, you can consult with any one of the expert uh, reference staff in any of the reading rooms. Mm -hmm. um, we also are trying to launch different initiatives uh, that would encourage perhaps uh, non-traditional uh, law uh, library users or library users. For example, we just uh, recently won Library's inaugural Friends Choice Award contest. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, are wanting to promote- what that is? Sure. So uh, the Friends of the Law Library is just like any other friends group that uh, people who, who might be familiar with uh, public libraries, you know, there's always a friends group. So the Friends Choice Award, there was a contest run internally. We, uh, various divisions made proposals. Um, our proposal won. Um, and it was on promoting civics knowledge and education, mm -hmm. um, which uh, was created and spearheaded by our Office of External Relations here in the Law Library. And our hope is that it'll unleash the creativity of the American public through a public challenge to engage uh, computer science hobbyists to create a fun educational nonpartisan video game related to mm -hmm. civics education mm -hmm. that incorporates uh, Library of Congress resources. So the submission period has just opened and mm. it's open through November, uh, just around Thanksgiving time. Mm. And um, so this is, you know, this is one way we're trying to reach audiences beyond traditional law uh, or legal researchers. Um, and if you are in DC, I do hope that you take the opportunity to come visit our exhibit, uh, this Join in Voluntary Associations in America is on display at least through the end of this calendar year. It's That's in great. the South Gallery of the beautiful Jefferson Building. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's so much more I can say about our uh, services and our offerings. And if there's something that you feel we can do better, <laughs> uh, please do reach out and, and let us know. 
we we are truly the you know here to serve the needs of any any legal researcher and and we hope to expand our services and collections to everyone whether you're in montana or alaska, alaska it doesn't matter yes. <laughs> i do have uh, you know it, it's when you talked about the number of employees that you have I, and you talked about how long some of your employees have served. Um, this is, I don't know if I can say we're at a crisis point in law libraries, but we're at a point where we're finding it very difficult to um, recruit and attract um, newcomers to the profession. Um, how are you dealing with that? If you, if you have this huge need um, and you have an aging of the uh, for lack of a better word, I don't know what else I can say, but it is aging out. Um, how are you facing that challenge? Yeah, indeed, that is really uh, currently one of our big challenges here, because um, as, as you've absolutely put, um, perhaps due to the pandemic, there has been a great attrition across libraries. And I, I think across the globe in pretty much every industry. Um, and our challenge especially here is attracting um, qualified foreign law specialists for example the foreign law specialists uh, in the law library are uh, a very unique group of folks they not only have um, the um, qualifications require a law degree from their respective country or region uh, that they'll be covering um, in addition to an LLM, mm -hmm. uh, some of them even have a JD from US. Uh, there's also, as, as we uh, may have touched on already, that there's a very stringent uh, security check and background clearance, which includes a, a three-year US residency requirement prior to hiring. Mm -hmm. So it's really difficult to attract prospective hires with those qualifications and then ask them to move to one of the most expensive parts of the country. <laughs> so um, it, is, it, is, it is truly a, a challenge that uh, across LC attrition and retention yeah. of highly qualified staff. So one of the things we are trying to do and, and we have in the law library actually incorporated to all of our performance plans in the management team is succession planning. So we are investing uh, resources and efforts and creating opportunities to ensure that positions that would be identified as sort of a single point of failure. So you have one individual that only knows how to do a certain task. Uh, we are trying to create opportunities to have staff uh, who are equally um, adept, at least in picking up the, the key uh, job uh, responsibilities should should we uh, lose that individual for any number of reasons, right? So succession planning has been a key focus for us in the law library for these um, critical positions and, and uh, incorporating that truly into everyone's performance plan and, and ensuring there are certain del deliverables and milestones with, with that level of planning. I can imagine. I'm, I'm curious as to the research librarians, the reference librarians, if you require um, as much. So, uh, you know, a JD and an MLS. So is there more flexibility in that realm, the non-foreign law specialists? So there is certainly, I mean, those are preferred. Um, so we, we are not requiring a JD, um, the, 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 those are just preferred and we are fortunate. We've uh, always attracted mm -hmm. uh, candidates with both a JD and an MLS. Um, it, it's wonderful if they bring any other degrees or uh, subject matter expertise to the table. Uh, but uh, no, it's not as, as uh, stringent as the foreign law specialists. Um, that's great. So moving on to our next question, I see that we're over half, halfway, so I'll, I'll move this along. The, the next question is, is it true that you collect all legal texts, like everything that's published? And um, 
Nadishan, what are your collecting responsibilities and priorities? What does it look like collecting at the Law Library of Congress? Is it every book? Is that the copyright deposit? Is that the deposit element there? Um, what happened? No, that is that is a good question. So, I mean, I, so what is meant by all, right? So we are unable to collect everything, but we do collect legal texts in all formats. Um, so we are try to be very comprehensive geographically. Uh, the collection spans all periods of law and all systems of law. So common, civil, customary, religious, and socialist, they're all represented uh, as are all topics within the law. Uh, our primary responsibility uh, is you know, to collect materials to support the lawmaking functions of the US Congress, right? So the collection policy serves to build a collection that enables staff, legal specialists, and attorneys to provide that um, the thorough response to to often increasingly complex legal questions from Congress, the courts, the executive branch agencies. So to support that work, um, that's why approximately 60% of the collection is, is in the vernacular languages. Additionally, the collection supports uh, on-site and remote library patrons. So we, um, we try to acquire things in, in paper and digital formats and actively produce digital surrogates of, of our own collection. Mm -hmm. We are a repository for most publications of US Congress and hold a, a premier collection of the Supreme Court records and briefs. Mm -hmm. um, for all are those, major- are those digitized? I'm so sorry to jump in, but- Oh, that's a good- <laughs> Good segue. Yes. It's actually it's our next big digitization project. Okay, I'll we, wait for are... I'll wait for us to get to that question <laughs> then. But that that's been a, a thing that comes up all the time. The Supreme Court records and briefs are they yes. digitized? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that soon. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no, please. Um, for uh, all uh, major national, uh, state, and uh, equivalent jurisdictions, we we uh, the law library attempts to acquire and retain for the permanent collection, um, the, the following types of, of legal publications. So official gazettes, mm -hmm. constitutions, proceedings of constitutional conventions, session laws, codes, uh, compilations and consolidations of laws, mm -hmm. administrative rules and regulations, commentaries, indexes to laws, uh, judicial court decisions and reports, administrative court decisions and reports, uh, any digest or index of decisions and reports, treaties, mm -hmm. directories of legal profession, uh, dictionaries, encyclopedias. So those are sort of the, the corpus. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then we are very active in, in creating and curating uh, web archive collections throughout LC. Uh, Law Library obviously focuses on legal materials. So those collections are available to the public. Uh, in the, the Law Web Archive, we have uh, collections from the U.S. Uh, Congressional Web Archive. These are member websites uh, from the House of Representatives and the Senate, mm -hmm. uh, legal blogs, uh, federal courts web archive, which which harvests the sites of the Supreme Court, federal district courts, and specialized federal courts, as well as international courts and tribunals. So the web archive collection is is ever so growing as well. That's mind boggling. That's a lot. Of fun. <laughs> which I don't know if you're done, but I. It leads you to yes, I'm done. I can't even wrap my head around all that you're pre you know collecting and curating, preserving, and making accessible. And um, a question that came up was, do you have storage challenges and what are they like? I mean, how are you managing if you have storage challenges, which I can imagine that you're dealing with that with all the um, texts that you have to retain. Um, in the historical texts that you already have. So what are you doing with um, storage challenges? So um, we are, believe it or not, actually in, in fairly good shape uh, regarding shelving the collection here because, um, uh, well, first of all, as an institution, the Library of Congress has a no withdrawal policy mm. for the collections, which is, which is supported uh, supporting the Congress, right? So due to the inevitable growth, um, Congress has funded and expanding uh, our offsite storage facility. Mm -hmm. 
which has benefited the law library immensely. Uh, we send several thousand volumes off-site regularly. Where, where uh, is your off-site storage? It's in Maryland. It's in Fort Meade, Maryland. Uh, <laughs> it, it has multiple modules. Uh, they're currently constantly, we're outgrowing as well. And a, a major benefit to managing the, the size of the collection was uh, in 2015, uh, there was an additional service copies policy implemented at uh, LC institution wide. And under that policy, custodial divisions were authorized to withdraw excess copies of collection items. Mm -hmm. So the policy um, does not permit complete removal of a title, but it permits reduction in copies. So this was a yeah significant benefit to the law library, which had been seeing annual volume counts in excess of 40,000 volumes. Yeah. So that policy allowed staff to, to right size the collection, removing titles that once numbered up to 10 sets oh, yeah. from a time when print was the only way to access the material. Uh, so as a result, the collection has only seen a net increase of about 13,000 plus volumes in the seven years since that policy was implemented without any loss of content from the collection. So um, the, the other big multi-year project we're involved in is, is we're in the midst of a complete replacement of our on-site compact shelving in our mm. on-site stacks. So for those of you who, you know, stacks at LC are closed stacks. So the law collection is housed here in the Madison building in the sub-basement. It's about one and a half football fields yes. long of compact shelving. Uh, and that legacy shelving, unfortunately, is past its lifespan and, and breaking down. We that too, yeah. Yes. Legacy shelving, yeah. <laughs> yep, so due to obviously changes in building and safety standards. The new shelving we're uh, putting in has actually a lower capacity because of the reduced height and, and width of the aisle requirements. So we are able to send materials off site and, and weed those duplicates, uh, which reduces the stress that we would uh, mm -hmm. otherwise face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, that's, that's, that, that's, what we've been doing as far as managing the the storage challenges here that's wonderful yeah we we definitely have um challenges with our uh, compact shelving and i think most libraries um are facing that so good to know maybe we'll um check in with you and find out you know what the installation process the new installation process was it's like painfully <laughs> painfully <laughs> it's painful to, yeah we're gonna have to face that music soon I got a question from an individual who is curious as to whether the Law Library of Congress participates or is interested in collaborative projects with other law libraries. So do you work closely with other law libraries? If not, are you interested? And in what dimension or capacity could this be? So um, yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, last fall, one of our very successful initiatives have been uh, with the state law libraries outreach. Um, what we've been doing and the purpose of that outreach is is to strengthen the ties between the Law Library of Congress and state law libraries through um, not only providing a guest spot um, for the state law library during our really well attended orientation to law library collections webinars. This is one of our recurring webinars we do. So the state law librarians or their designees get to have a national audience mm -hmm. uh, where they can discuss their collections and services. And since the initiation uh, of this, this project last fall, we've hosted special appearances from the law libraries in California, New York, uh, Minnesota, uh, this July, we'll have Virginia, and then September, we have Georgia, and then in November, we have Wisconsin. So um, those planning meetings with the law libraries uh, has been a great opportunity for me and my team to not only meet them and their staff, but to learn about their priorities, um, their challenges, and, and identify really areas where we can collaborate on mutual goals. Um, so that's that's been one of our um, recent uh, outreach. And we are currently, uh, I know we, we sort of hinted at the Supreme Court records and brief yes. digitization. Yes. 
Yes. So we are working with our uh, neighbor, the Supreme Court Library, um, on on preparing for that. Mm. What looks to be at least a ten-year digitization project. It, it, it's going to be massive. I can only imagine. There was another question talking about digitization projects, and uh, this individual was curious as to whether you actually even work with commercial vendors. Um, so, and what does that look like? Um, does that mean that if you do, and I don't know what the answer is, if you do, does that mean that access to the information that's digitized goes behind a paywall? So this is a very interesting question. In short, no, do that you is work with commercial vendors and in what capacity if you do? Yes, that is an interesting question. I, I do have a lengthy response to this, so you can cut me off if we're short on time, but- We have like uh, four <laughs> minutes, so we'll see. <laughs> so um, the law library, we entertain solicitations from commercial vendors to, to undertake various digitization proposals of, of our collections, but we have to follow libraries policy, uh, which is on our website. It's the third party digitization agreement. Mm -hmm. It outlines very much the requirements, but I'll, I'll briefly touch on it. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's Library of Congress has two main purposes in expanding the library's digital collections and engaging in a no cost digitization agreements with third parties. And the, the two main purposes of that, uh, that engagement is to increase public access to the collection and related materials and to preserve and secure the material for uh, future use. Mm -hmm. So the process is very much guided by uh, additional goals of mm -hmm. open government, transparency, open competition, and obviously adherence to copyright law mm -hmm. uh, when we entertain such agreements. Mm -hmm. So that those third party digitization proposals, when we assess them, we consider um, whether entering into that agreement is in the best interest of the library, the public, and the US. Mm -hmm. And those considerations include a number of uh, items. So, for example, whether the project is an institutional priority for us, uh, the cost to the library to support such project, not only financial, but, you know, human resource cost, uh, the financial benefits to the library, including if there are any subscription reductions or royalties, mm -hmm. uh, the condition of the materials that are being proposed to be digitized, because often something may need to go through conservation uh, before it's prepared to be digitized, the value of any materials received in exchange, um, mm. any non-financial benefits to the library, including the quality of the metadata provided, uh, any preservation benefits, including reduced use of our fragile materials, maximizing any benefits to the public, uh, for example, uh, immediate or free online access to the digitized content, mm -hmm. uh, any added value of the, the online presentations, if there are any enhancements provided, filling gaps in the collections that we already have online, mm -hmm. and making them available um, to the public, to the researcher, or, uh, or anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also look at uh, any negative impact of yeah. the restrictions in the agreement, right? If there's a detriment to the public in the delay of, uh, you know, of something being freely available, any technical standards for digitization and metadata, so it needs to be of a certain quality, yeah. um, and then uh, qualifications of that partner or project personnel, including their ability to meet the technical standards. Uh, they have to have demonstrated experience in handling and digitizing the, the materials they're proposing. Um, so um, recently, a lot, a lot of requirements, which I know sounds probably daunting and discouraging, uh, but back in 2022, so just last year, we uh, signed an MOU a memorandum of understanding with Hein Online, uh, where we created a database on Hein Online's platform for our law library reports. Uh, this is a reports that our foreign law specialists create in response to uh, foreign comparative and international law topics. These reports are already available freely on our website, and they've uh, the legacy reports that are older that date back to 1940s. We've already are digitizing and releasing mm -hmm. and um, 
the the agreement with Hein was our way of expanding access to an academic audience. So is um, it it's not behind a Hein subscription? Like, is it open? It is in the Hein subscription, but uh, it's also the reports are also freely available on our website, and we've already oh, done okay. the digitization of these. It's reports. just in multiple locations, multiple. Uh, yes, and it's yeah. provides the ability to be indexed in academic indexes. So currently, you know, anything on our website is really discoverable by yeah. just search engines, right? Uh, so incorporating unique content that we produce like these law library reports into a academic database like Hein mm. uh, allows it to be picked up by commercial indexes and really expands the access to the collection the uh, to an academic, yes, scholarly audience. Because these reports are, you know, they address specific legal issues in a particular country mm. and they provide a comparative analysis. And as, as you know, doing comparative foreign law research is, is very challenging to find authoritative, timely uh, coverage of a developing legal topic. So this is what these reports are. Um, and they, they look at an individual problem across multitude of countries. Mm -hmm. And they are often written in response to a request we received either from the Congress or an executive agency. And they're often cited as expert resources. Our foreign law specialists often even uh, have uh, been experts at uh, hearings or have provided testimonies. So mm -hmm. these these reports are are uh, unique publications of the law library. And and the, because it is also a historical collection going back to the 1940s, it provides a really historical glimpse into important legal questions. So would which would really appeal to a, an academic audience doing a comparative legal research. That's wonderful. So I see we have about eight minutes. I'm going to do what I call, I'm going to call a mashup. I'm going to mash up the last couple of questions and I'll let you, you know, pick what you want to pick out of the questions. But um, I have three questions and I think you can roll them up and mash them up. The, you know, the main challenges or the main challenge facing the Law Library of Congress, um, what special initiative, and you can pick your, your, your favorite initiative that you have in the pipeline. And, you know, to wrap it all up, your vision for the future of the library. And so big mashup, but I think we can do it in eight minutes. <laughs> no, that's it. That's a good, good, uh, good ending. Um, well, I mean, I think we kind of touched on the challenges, right? Uh, attrition and retention. Uh, is, so when you talk about challenge. retention, um, where do people leave? Where do they go? <laughs> where do they go? Well, where do they leave? <laughs> so our recent attrition has been, well, retirements. Retirement, um, yeah. We've yeah. had uh, resignations due to other greener pastures, oh, yeah. um, you know, benefits, salary, people right. relocating. Um, we've unfortunately even had... Uh, Back to back in, in January, we lost two staff members. They they passed away. So, you know, attrition happens for uh, any number of reasons. So that is that is a huge challenge. Um, um, the the initiatives question. Uh, so the, the big thing in the pipeline I touched on is the US Supreme Court records and briefs digitization project. We are currently working on inventorying the collection. Mm -hmm. uh, which which really will help us guide the planning and and provide cost estimates for this, uh, as I said, most likely a decade long project. Uh, we th this is by the way currently um, in sync. The inventory of this collection is in sync with an ongoing digitization project of the U.S. Congressional Serial Set, oh, which okay. we are uh, we've had partnered with GPO on. Mm -hmm. And so that is on its tail end, mm -hmm. uh, and we are excited to be completing that and embarking on records and briefs. We are, uh, the challenges with that initiative is, you know, developing a digital tracking system of the collection, tracking all of the phases of that project, which is actually appears to be much more complicated than the congressional serial set. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that is that is a, a really exciting initiative. I think that we yeah, are excited. I'll tell you that. You know, <laughs> for this thing to happen, uh, ten years it's 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 great that it's happening. That it's on the horizon. Yes, um, we we have a, a, 
a mandate to do, to do this. So we are fully in and committed. Um, the the vision for the future of the law library. I I mean I I touched on this I guess kind of in the beginning too. The 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 vision and the mission has remained. Uh, continuing to improve availability and discovery, mm -hmm. as well as preservation of the collections. Mm -hmm. um, the, the challenge that I mentioned, this attrition is obviously feeding into the goals and my immediate uh, mission is to maintain and strengthen the staff expertise. Um, obviously continuing to support the long-term digitization strategy so that we can increase access to the collections, the products, the services. And we are very focused on free access to um, public domain US legal and legislative materials, but also unique foreign law materials. So one, one initiative I didn't touch on that we um, launched uh, during the pandemic was uh, digitizing our gazettes, which we had we had shifted for, for preservation purposes, we shifted microfilming our foreign legal gazettes to digitizing them. And with that, Plus, uh, yeah, we, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> we have the opportunity to now make those digitized gazettes mm -hmm. to be either freely available on mm -hmm. our portal Mm -hmm. uh, or on-site access to that digital content. So, and the, the what's driving that that route is copyright restriction. So we established a copyright clearance mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, so internally, our foreign law specialists are doing a review, uh, a copyright review to see whether a digitized gazette mm -hmm. can be released publicly. Mm -hmm. And then it goes through a second review by our general counsel's office. Mm -hmm. And if it, there's no copyright restrictions, those gazettes are then available freely to the public. Um, currently, we have about 16 jurisdictions represented in that portal in, in the just last two years, close to about 20,000 issues. Mm -hmm. And so as we digitize, we are doing the clearance and releasing them. And anything with a copyright restriction, as I said, is available on a on site on a on a Mm -hmm. platform that is only accessible yeah. on site for copyright restricted mm -hmm. digital content. Mm -hmm. So my hope in conclusion, I guess, is, is to continue connecting um, with internal and external partners and, and working on creating new collaborations and building uh, bridges with uh, between our public patrons and, and our services and collections. This is wonderful. This is so wonderful. Well, um, we're we have two more minutes, but I'm not going to, <laughs> not going to ask another question. I think uh, we're we're good to wrap up. I just wanted to thank you so much for your time. You're incredibly busy. Um, we think we're busy in academic law libraries, but what you do is, um, like I said, mind boggling and head spinning. Um, and we appreciate uh, the projects and the outreach of the Law Library of Congress. What you do is making such wonderful impact in the lives of ordinary citizens, of researchers and scholars. So we just uh, want to encourage you to continue to do what you do. Your vision is fantastic. Um, we are here to support you in any, you know, I don't want to promise a way too much. <laughs> we, 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 we are here, we're cheering you on and we can support you and uh, work collaboratively with you. Um, I, I take it from this conversation that when we're in DC, we can come up to the Law Library of Congress, enjoy an exhibit, um, we have a research request, um, there are reference librarians, and we might actually spot you, Aslihan, at the desk, um, <laughs> which would be a That's treat. right. I am I am on the desk once a week on Fridays. If you're unfortunate enough to have me assist you, it might take longer. <laughs> That's what I say. So sometimes I do get the random reference question that comes my way and it does take me much longer because you're not doing it uh, routinely. But thank you again for your time and best wishes to our colleagues um, at the Law Library of Congress. Hope to meet up with you on another date. Um, oh, so thank, thank you, you so much. This was wonderful. I, I so very much enjoyed the conversation and I hope, you know, we can connect at AAWL. I hope you're, you're attending. Uh, I'm not, but I have oh. a large contingent um, of um, From Yale. Parents, uh, Yale. So you will meet my colleagues at AAWL. All right. Well, okay. then thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye. 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 <laughs>